on World News Tonight. Looming invasions. A major war may be on the verge of breaking loose as Russian President Vladimir Putin has resorted to drastic measures. In response, Western superpowers relentlessly sanctioned the controversial country. Concerned nation. The United Kingdom is ready to begin its journey back to normalcy as COVID cases are on the road to reduction. However, citizens still remain anxious on the Queen's status. Curing cancer. AstraZeneca may be heading the fight against yet another lethal disease, apart from COVID jabs, as the company unveils its latest drug which prolongs the survival of breast cancer patients. And vibrant celebrations. Nice is bathed in an array of colour as fabulous floats make its way through bustling city streets accompanied by cheers of many. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight. Reporting from Colombo, here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening, thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We begin tonight's broadcast with stark new warnings of the Russian invasion. It may be doomsday for Ukraine and many Western superpowers as President Vladimir Putin has decided to send in peacekeeping troops into the bordering regions of Ukraine, while also recognizing certain separatist back states within the country as well. Russian President Vladimir Putin recognized two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine as independent on Monday and ordered the Russian army to launch what Moscow called a peacekeeping operation in the area. The moves further up the ante in a crisis the West fears could unleash a major war. In a lengthy televised address, a visibly angry Putin described Ukraine as an integral part of Russia's history, calling eastern Ukraine ancient Russian land and said he was confident the Russian people would support his decision. We demand from those who captured and hold the power in Kiev to immediately end the combat activities. Otherwise, all responsibility for the possible continuation of the bloodshed will be entirely on the conscience of the regime ruling the territory of Ukraine. Putin told Russia's defense ministry to deploy troops into the two breakaway regions to, quote, keep the peace in a decree issued shortly after he announced recognition for Russia-backed separatists there. Moscow's action may well torpedo a last-minute bid for a summit with U.S. President Joe Biden aimed at preventing a Russian invasion of Ukraine. The White House on Monday said Biden strongly condemned Putin's decree, while leaders in Britain, Germany, France, the United States and the EU all vowed to impose swift sanctions on Russia in response to Putin's actions. Following the risky move by Russia, the United States has decided to put in place severe sanctions in case of a serious invasion by the country. Diplomats are hopeful that the financial restrictions will force the superpower to rethink any drastic moves. Footage showed tanks and military vehicles driving through eastern Ukraine early on Tuesday as members of the UN Security Council held an emergency meeting over fears of a Russian invasion. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Linda Thomas-Greenfield said a new round of sanctions on Russia would be coming later in the day after Russian President Vladimir Putin sent what he called peacekeepers into two Ukrainian breakaway regions, Luhansk and Donetsk. This is nonsense. We know what they really are. In doing so, he has put before the world a choice. We must meet the moment and we must not look away. Putin recognized the Russian separatist-controlled regions as independent just hours earlier in what the U.S. called a pretext for war. His lengthy televised announcement drew near-immediate international condemnation and a U.S. executive order prohibiting any American business activity with the breakaway regions. Britain, France, Germany and the EU have also agreed to respond with sanctions while Japan says it will join another round of U.S. sanctions being planned in case of a full-scale invasion. Meanwhile, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky, who received a call of solidarity from U.S. President Joe Biden, accused Russia of wrecking peace talks and vowed not to concede any territories. Russia's ambassador to the U.N. said Monday eastern Ukraine was on the brink of a, quote, military adventure that Moscow could not allow, and warned Western powers to think twice about potentially worsening the situation. Russia has repeatedly denied any plans of attacking neighboring Ukraine, as suspicions from Western powers grew louder and louder over the past few weeks. But it has threatened unspecified actions unless it receives sweeping security guarantees 
including a promise that Ukraine will never join NATO. The UK government has promised to sanction Russia over President Vladimir Putin's decision to recognize two breakaway regions in eastern Ukraine. We have our Vienna World News special correspondent Malchia Besekara from Norwich in the UK for more. Yes, Anuradhi. The Prime Minister is expected to set out further details in the UK Parliament later. Health Secretary Sajid Javid accused Russia of a flagrant violation of Ukraine's sovereignty, adding it appeared an invasion of the country had already begun. He added UK sanctions would be targeted at individuals and companies linked to the Russian government and Russia's economy. Several of the UK's Western allies, the US, France and the European Union, made similar pledges, condemning Mr Putin's move and promising sanctions. Johnson told Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky that he believed an invasion was a real possibility in the coming hours and days. In a phone call, the Prime Minister told Zelensky that he would explode sending further defensive support to Ukraine at the request of the country's government, as well as detailing sanctions. He said Putin's decision to recognize the two separatist Ukrainian regions was plainly in breach of international law and stated that the decision was a very ill omen that things were moving in the wrong direction in Ukraine. The legislation gave the government pause to impose sanctions on Russian businesses and individuals in strategically significant sectors, such as the chemical, defense, extractives, ICT, and financial services. Back to you, Anuradhi. All right, thank you. That was other than a World News Special Correspondent, Malchia Besekra from Norwich in the UK. Prime Minister Modi's presidential influence may hang in the balance soon as India's local elections have officially begun. The votes come in the wake of year-long farmer protests against Modi's government led by Punjabi farmers groups. The queues continue to grow in this polling station in Punjab in what could be a test for Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi ahead of the 2024 general election. Modi's BJP party has stepped up efforts to woo Punjab's citizens with promises of more jobs, farming subsidies and stamping out the state's endemic drug problem. Whilst Modi's Hindu Nationalist Party has flourished in much of northern India, farmers make up one of the country's largest voting blocs, and anger against him runs deep within the Sikh-majority state. His controversial change to farming laws in September 2020 without parliamentary approval triggered a year of intense protest from farmers in Punjab, Camping on the outskirts of Delhi throughout the pandemic, a brutal winter and record rains, more than 700 farmers died during the demonstrations. The PM withdrew the laws just three months before the polls opened in Punjab and four other states, and the government still hasn't recognised the deaths. Running against the BJP party are candidates from the incumbent Congress party, the regional Aam Admi party and new contender Sanyuk Samaj Murcha which encompasses some of the farm unions that led the protests. Punjab's local results will be announced on the 10th of March. Iranian President Ibrahim Raisi said that talks in Vienna on reviving Tehran's 2015 nuclear deal with world powers cannot succeed unless the United States is prepared to lift sanctions on the Islamic Republic. A nuclear deal that is making remarkable progress. <laughs> There has been a very remarkable progress in the talks. Of course, the scope and the number of topics have substantially reduced, but the remaining topics are the most difficult and the most serious key topics that must be resolved. One of the most important guarantees we asked for and we are pursuing seriously is the ability to restore our nuclear program. For Iran, the resurrection of any treaty depends on several key factors like this. On Sunday, legislators in Tehran urged President Ibrahim Raisi to set strict conditions for restoring the joint comprehensive plan of action. These conditions centre on the United States guaranteeing that they would not withdraw from such a deal again, as they did under the Donald Trump administration in 2018. For their part, the US have said they are willing to return to the deal and ease some of the US sanctions. President Raisi has responded by saying the U.S. should prove its will to lift such sanctions. After months of indirect talks to revive the pact, talks have reached a key point. I would like to emphasize here that we are ready to achieve a good deal 
The 2015 deal between Iran and major powers limited Iran's enrichment of uranium to make it harder for Tehran to develop material for nuclear weapons in return for a lifting of international sanctions against Tehran. But when the US withdrew, Iran breached the deal, rebuilding stockpiles of enriched uranium. Since April 2021, eight rounds of talks have been held in Austria's capital Vienna between Iran and the remaining JCPOA parties, namely Britain, China, France, Russia and Germany. The United States have only been indirectly involved in the talks to revive the landmark deal. Let's go in for a short commercial break. More world news on the other side. Welcome back to World News Tonight. While Her Majesty the Queen is not in the best spirits following her infection of COVID, the United Kingdom has decided that lifting restrictions is the best possible option for the country economically as well as socially, as the pandemic in the UK has decreased to a manageable extent. Tonight, even as the Queen is self-isolating with COVID, we have now passed the peak. Prime Minister Boris Johnson is pushing ahead with an end to almost all restrictions to contain the virus. I know the whole house will join me in sending our best wishes to Her Majesty the Queen. Starting Thursday, people in England no longer legally required to stay home if they test positive. And free mass testing, a hallmark of Britain's COVID response, will be scaled back at the end of next month. Summer, Johnson arguing England's clear. high vaccination rate means it's safe to go ahead. Let us learn to live with this virus and continue protecting ourselves and others without restricting our freedoms. Outside Buckingham Palace, mixed reaction to lifting the restrictions. For me personally, I've, it's a bit quick for me. I think we should get back to normal. The palace says the Queen is experiencing mild cold-like symptoms, but will continue light duties from Windsor Castle this week. Meanwhile, heir to the throne Prince Charles, recently recovered from his own bout of COVID, expected to continue appointments. And the Duchess of Cambridge, still scheduled to make a solo trip to Denmark tomorrow. A nation trying to look beyond the pandemic, even as its Queen faces the virus up close. We have some good news for you. AstraZeneca has been the latest company bearing fruitful effort in the fight against cancer as the company's new drug has proven to prolong the survival of breast cancer patients significantly. AstraZeneca said its in her to cancer drug will help patients suffering from a type of advanced breast cancer live longer. They said in her to prolong survival and slow the progression of metastatic breast cancer with low levels of a protein known as HER2. Sufferers are often faced with poor treatment options. The drug maker described the improvement as clinically meaningful compared to standard chemotherapy. AstraZeneca said it would now reach out to regulatory agencies to enable a speedy review of wider use for the drug. And her two belongs to a promising class of therapies called antibody drug conjugates, known as ADCs. They are engineered antibodies that bind to tumour cells and then release cell-killing chemicals. While the study was limited to low HER2 patients whose tumours had spread to other parts of the body, analysts say in future the drug could be used at an earlier stage of diagnosis. This would potentially open the door to a much larger patient group. The drug is also being tested against other forms of cancer, including gastric, lung and colorectal types. AstraZeneca said detailed results of the late-stage trial would be presented at an as-yet undisclosed medical conference. Protesters have promised to cause more chaos after hijacking a popular Sydney bridge in peak hour traffic. Half a dozen activists brought traffic to a standstill after occupying the Spit Bridge. We have our World News Special Correspondent Katya Fernando from Melbourne in Australia for more. Katya? Yes, Sanaradi. They were carrying signs saying Fireproof Australia and demanding an aerial firefighting fleet. Major traffic delays were seen on the bridge as the protesters blocked all city-bound lanes from the northern beaches. Traffic came to a standstill in the area as the protesters refused to move before being dragged off the street. Police were forced to remove people off the bridge after they sat on the road holding large signs. Fireproof Australia has since issued a statement online, vowing to cause even more chaos in the coming days and weeks. 
A video was also posted to the organization's Facebook page where a protester promised to sit on the road until the Australian government organized a fire-flighting aerial large fleet. Fireproof Australia describes itself as a campaign of civil resistance and wants the government to respond urgently to the climate crisis. It comes a day after the city's train network shut down completely, adding to the morning commuter kills. It is not yet known whether any charges will be laid. Traffic has resumed over the bridge as locals took to the social media to express outrage over the traffic chaos. Back to you, Anurabi. All right, thank you. That was other than a worldly special correspondent, Katya Fernando from Melbourne in Australia. A new report shows sea levels around the world, mainly around America, will rise rapidly over the next three decades. The amount will equal the rise that was seen over the last century. According to a newly released report from the U.S. National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, U.S. sea levels will rise on average by about 25 to 30 centimeters in the next 30 years. That's the same amount as has been seen over the last century. The report also says that until the year 2100, sea levels are forecast to rise by 61 centimeters, and if carbon emissions are not reduced, they may rise anywhere from 110 to 210 centimeters. Moreover, by 2050, moderate flooding is expected to occur more than 10 times as often as it does today. Meanwhile, last October, a study from nonprofit research group Climate Central found that approximately 50 major coastal cities around the world will disappear if the planet warms to 3 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels. The analysis, conducted in collaboration with Princeton University and the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research in Germany, found that approximately 600 million people will be inundated if the temperature rise does occur. The Asia-Pacific region will be most affected, with eight of the ten most affected areas forecast to be in Asian countries such as China, India and Vietnam. Experts concluded that coastal cities must implement adaptation measures to prevent inundation. Meanwhile, it was reported last August that the world is already around 1.2 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial levels. Experts say that while the rise in sea levels is inevitable, steps can be taken to reduce them. Welcome back to World News Tonight. For more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Massive plumes of ash steam towered over Sicily as Italy's Mount Etna was back in action. The volcanic ash clouds rose some six miles into the sky from a southeast crater of Europe's tallest and most active volcano, causing the nearby Catania airport to shut down. Judges on Colombia's constitutional court voted to decriminalize abortion until 24 weeks of gestation. The court said in a statement in a victory for abortion rights groups which sued to have the procedure removed from the penal code. The Novavax vaccine was recently made available in South Korea and since then more unvaccinated people are lining up to get jabbed. The number of people getting first shots increased by almost 20,000 one week after the latest vaccine began being administered on February 14th. China has placed Lockheed Martin and Raytheon under sanctions over arms sales to Taiwan. The government said at least the third time it has announced punishments against the US companies. Hong Kong rushed to build isolation facilities to house thousands of coronavirus patients as construction crews from mainland China worked in the rain and chilly weather. A cross-border media investigation broke claiming that Switzerland's second-largest bank has held tens of billions of dollars of ill-gotten funds, claims based on an insider's massive data leak. Credit Suisse stands accused of having ties with criminals, including alleged human rights abusers and dictators. This after a data leak published the accounts of more than 18,000 of its clients. The source of the revelations? A whistleblower who sent his findings to German newspaper Süddeutsche Zeitung. The data was then passed on to several outlets, including the New York Times and The Guardian. The findings included accounts dating back to the 1940s. The most recent ones, the 2010s. The 18,000 accounts collectively held more than $100 billion, some of them linked to questionable funds. Among the most notable names, 
King Abdullah of Jordan, who had deposited a sum of over 230 million euros. The sons of former Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak and the accounts of his late intelligence chief, Omar Suleiman, who had been accused of torture. Former Algerian president, the late Abdel Aziz Bouteflika, was also identified. For many, the news comes as no surprise. Switzerland has struggled to shed its image as a banking haven for criminals. Its 1934 Banking Act meant that employees who disclose confidential customer information could end up in prison. While the laws were changed recently to combat fraud, parts of the legislation still mean a person can be prosecuted for publishing banking data. The strict laws has meant some employees turn a blind eye to the criminal origins of funds. Credit Suisse has denied any wrongdoing. It claims 90% of the accounts have now been closed. The revelations add to a string of crises that have hit the bank in recent years. In 2014, it was engulfed in an American tax evasion scandal, which resulted in a fine of $2.6 billion. Last year, it was forced to pay $475 million after it was involved in a bribery scheme in Mozambique. And that's all the news we got for you tonight. Join us again tomorrow for more news around the globe. In case you have missed any of the stories we aired tonight, you can rewatch by catching us on our YouTube page, youtube.com slash other than English. We're leaving you tonight with spectacular visuals of the King of Animals themed float parade in Nice, France. Thank you for watching. Good night.